Um, my name is Christopher Kaufman Dillstrup. Um, I am the director of Vermont Humanities, and I'm really delighted to be here uh, with my good friend John uh, and Sean and Wendy. Wendy's going to do the introductions, but I just wanted to say a couple of things. There's copies of our uh, Hot Off the Press Fall newsletter there. Our fall festival, which is the reboot of the conference that we did for many, many decades, um, is uh, in the, the fall festival. It opens with a tribute to Prince down in Bethel, Vermont. The theme of the festival this year is music. There's a lot of events happening all over the state. I hope you'll come out to one of them. Uh, we've got Reuben Jackson coming to the festival. We've got a great talk on the player piano down at the Main Street Museum, down at White River Junction, uh, and some stuff around here as well. Um, I also wanted to just uh, say that uh, today we announced uh, the uh, 2023 Floods Cultural Recovery uh, Grant Program. Um, we received a $200,000 grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities um, to kick us off. We've raised an additional $165,000. We'd like to raise another thirty-five dollars and have a total of $400,000 to give. Um, if you can contribute to that fund, there's a link on our website. Um, please do go and, uh, and make a gift. It supports museums, libraries, cultural institutions all around the state who've been impacted by the flooding over the course of the summer. So um, thanks very much for coming this evening. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Wendy, and she will introduce folks. Hi. Thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, my name is Wendy Pisco, and I'm the library director here at Brownell Library. And on behalf of Brownell Library, I wanted to wait, uh, welcome you to uh, this snapshot event, the 1960s Fluxus Art Movement, Blurring Art and Life with John Kalecki and Sean Klu. We extend thanks to our partners at Vermont Humanities, as well as to the generous underwriters who've made it possible for us to offer such rich and robust programming. The sponsor of an entire snapshot series is the Vermont Department of Libraries and the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Library sponsors are Brownell Library Foundation and Home Care Assistance of Greater Burlington. Tonight, we come together from across the state to listen, to learn, and to be inspired in community. Before we begin, I just have a couple of housekeeping tips. We are cl the library closes at 8 p.m., so if you have any transactions, please get to the desk as soon as you can, and we have restroom keys that can be picked up at the main desk. The next snapshot event is going to be hosted by the Manchester Community Library, and it is an injury to all labor struggles during and beyond the pandemic with Jamie McCallum on September 27th at 7 p.m and you can register online to receive a link to live stream the program. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to our speakers. John R. Kalecki served in the Vermont House of Representatives and was the executive director of the Flynn. His videos have been screened in festivals, galleries, museums, hospitals, and universities worldwide and are in, the, in collections of numerous libraries and universities. Sean Clute is an electronic artist composer and performer. His art has been presented at the Kitchen, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, Museums Cordier Mien, ICAA, New Mexico, Dubai, and Montreal, Chazin Museum of Contemporary Art, and the Autonomous Mutant F Festival. Clute is the co-director of the Rural Noise Ensemble and professor of media art at Vermont State University. Please join me in welcoming John and Sean. Thank you so much. We're really glad to be here. And it's a small world because uh, we're going to be talking about the Fluxus art movement uh, in the early 60s. And uh, Nanjing Pike was uh, one of the seminal figures in that movement. And a friend of ours in the first row here told me that Nanjing Pike lived below them when she was a kid and he would come up and do the laundry. So if you want to hear more stories about that, we might talk to her about that. And I think it's Jen Berger's birthday today. So could everybody look back at the blonde? It's her birthday. All right. How marvelous that you chose to spend it here. Thank you. And really, many blessings on your birthday. So, you know, Sean and I have been uh, long enamored of, of the Fluxus Art Movement. I, I certainly have. And if you think about it, they were, these artists in the 60s were really inspired by Dada uh, around the First World War. Marcel Duchamp, who made ready-made things out of bicycles and remember he made the urinal. And it was, he, his whole thing was, if an artist makes it, 
it, it's art, right? And the, the audience defines that, okay? The, but then, it really, the seminal figure in this particular moment is John Cage. And we're gonna talk about John Cage. But what these pe people did is they wanted to really break down all the established norms in painting, in sculpture, in performance, in music, in film, and they wanted to blur the distinctions between art and life. And what they did is they celebrated common day activities, okay? And their focus was really on the process of creation and not on the object. So their point was never really about creating something beautiful. In fact, it was almost anti-beauty. And, and we have some catalogs over there you can look at afterwards if, if you'd like. Um, and it was a group that wasn't really a, a fixed group because they worked internationally. But what was interesting, if, if I think anyway, um, and why I love them so much, is they so influenced conceptual art, postmodernism, uh, media, and the visual arts in a very profound way because they, they dismantled all notions of this. And so it was the artist after them that really made objects that could be collected in museums that we really remember, and this group we don't really remember as well. So in 1958, John Cage was teaching at the New School, and he had something, a series of lectures called Composition as Process. And he talked a lot about Duchamp, of course, but he also was studying the I Ching and Zen Buddhism. And so he really wanted to talk about how and he, it was all distinctions between art and life, he wanted just removed. And he embraced randomness, chance operations, and really he was the early adopter to technology in his classes. So it was this group of people who took John Cage's classes that came out in the world, uh, very energized, very confused about what art is, but like Alan Capra, the next year, did the first happening. Um, and that was at the Rubin Gallery in New York. And happenings were these very immersive things you walked in and there was music and there were films, someone was taking a shower, someone was, was frying something, and you were, you were to define what it was that was happening for you, okay? The artist wasn't really defining that. Um, Jim Dine, Oldenburg, Red Grooms, Al Hansen, George Siegel, others started doing these happenings as well. Um, at the same time that he was doing the happenings, Yoko Ono, her husband was in John Cage's class, not, not the later husband, the Beatle, the earlier husband, and she was working in her loft with a composer named Lamont Young. Okay, and um, they were presenting these conceptual artists who were doing these kinds of non-events, non-object related things. Um, and there was another guy by the name of George Machunas. And he started presenting what he called his Nido Dada, Nido Dada events uh, in his gallery. And that was in 1960. And all of these people that were in his gallery and in these performances had taken John Cage's class. Okay, now Machunas was an interesting character because um, Machunas was a graphic designer as well as uh, an artist. And he, the side thing is Machunas was the first person to convince artists to take over the derelict Soho Art District. There wasn't a district at that point. And Machunas put together 15 living co op buildings. And one that I had an experience with was what Laura Dean, I mean, uh, Trisha Brown, David Gordon, Lucinda Childs, and Douglas Dunn, the leaders in the postmodern room, all got into one building together, and it was all because of George Machunas. Now, George is um, a, a curious figure because he was terrible at business. He, he could never, ever do anything uh, that lasted very long. So every time the gallery opened, it lasted for a year. So now he's off in Germany, and in 1962, he decided he was going to sort of create a magazine, a magazine called Fluxus, 
So he invited all these artists, these neo Dada artists he was calling them, to come out of Germany to make a Fluxus event to raise money for the magazine. Okay. So, um, Sean, why don't you give that to Roshan and, and would you turn on the Reese button? Video? So what we what we found um, on, on YouTube uh, was the 1962 Wiesbaden Festival, and it's degraded, but it's it's only about five minutes long, and you'll get to see actually what these artists look like doing some of these things. So that's Alison Knowles, and the then husband Das ist George Bushies und Ben Patterson, die sich jetzt auf dem Kopf stellen. Je schräger, desto besser. Schräge Musik sagt es. Leute, die mit den eigenen Waffen schreien, was die Dadaisten können, können wir schon lange. Die alte Musik ist zu künstlich, behaupten die Neo-Dadaisten. Wir wollen natürlich sein. So sieht das dann in der Praxis aus. Das Publikum teilt sich in zwei Tage. Ein kleines, das Parallelen zieht zu UNESCO und Wecke. Das wesentlich größere Lager zieht aber komplett Parallelen zum Zirkus. Faule Tomaten flogen trotzdem nicht. Man war tolerant und hatte seinen Spaß. Benjamin Tyson stammen die Variationen für Kontrabass. Anno 1962 kommt ein Bassist mit Instrument und Bogen nicht mehr aus. Er braucht einen ganzen Koffer voll Requisiten. So years earlier, John Cage had prepared a piano and put things under the string. So Ben Patterson is taking it a step further from what John Cage has done with this instrument. Ein gutes 
Er ist destabiliert, steht friedlich und bescheiden und musste bei so mancherlei erdulden und erleiden. So they started to reach Baden, but, but the Tunis had, had done like four or five other festival gigs that he had booked as well. So they went from town to town, and of course they egged each other on and got a little wilder and wilder uh, as they went on. But they came back to New York, and suddenly there was a fluxus movement, even though there wasn't really a fluxus movement. And because many of these artists were in Germany, and some were in Italy. Uh, you know, the MG Pike came from Korea, and he was living in Germany at the time. And so everybody dispersed, but they loved these images of working with these scores, these performance scores, and giving up authorship, and allowing anyone to do the idea. And it would be just as valid if you chose to do a draw line and follow it as what Sean did or what Nanjun Pike did. And so suddenly there was a fluxus movement. Um, Non-ego, task-oriented, ephemeral, there wasn't really a way to think that there were going to be objects. And sort of the artists really wanted to challenge the value of art. It was an assault against the Museum of Modern Art and collecting institutions, saying, you know, we can do this. Marcel Duchamp taught us if we can do this. John Cage taught us we can do this. We're going to do it in our own way. They also were very playful, as you saw. They, they, were, uh, very, they were serious in their intention, but they didn't take themselves very seriously. They had a good time with it, and because they, they didn't have ownership. There wasn't anything to own but the, other, the idea. Um, the other thing is because it was so dispersed in these different countries, Japan did it very differently than Italy did it, as France did it. And so you see this, these fluxus artists for about 10 years doing things, sometimes together, sometimes very separately. The key, though, was this event score, that they wanted to really have this, and it really was representing the idea or the thought experiment, and they had these sheets. And so, like George Brecht did one, it was very famous, called Drip Music. And the score read this, for a single or multiple performances, a source of dripping water and an empty vessel are arranged so that the water falls into the vessel. That was it. That was the score. stood in the tub and poured a bucket of water over his head to do that score. Other people pour water into tubas and tried to play them filled with water to do that score. Uh, we mentioned the Lamat Young piece, draw a straight line and follow it, which I, I just love. It's sort of my mantra. I think that's such a great one. Um, Yoko Ono is uh, a major fluxus artist. And, you know, if people joke that she broke up the Beatles, but the Fluxus people say that John Lennon broke up Fluxus, okay? <laughs> so, uh, because Yoko was right there, and over on that uh, table is her book from 1964 called Grapefruit. And each page in there is a score, okay? And it, um, and she, she we, we have, we're showing some of the films, but she, she did a number of short films that were done in slow motion. One was called Light a Match, and watch till it goes out. And anyone could do it in any way they wanted to do that. And it was just in slow motion on the film, is how she did it.
Allison Knowles, one of the uh, original women in, in Wiesbaden, one of the original Fluxus folks, she had a number of amazing pieces she, she did. One was called the Via Cream, Nivea Cream, where she just had the performers rub cream on their hands and just rub their hands in front of microphones. And that was, the, that was their sound score. Uh, she had one called Make a Salad that she originally did in 1962, and it was just called Make a Salad. But um, Allison was in 2019 in Disney Hall in Los Angeles. They did a performance of Make a Salad with about 40 people on stage chopping the salad up, and everybody was mic'd, and the audience sat there and listened to the sounds of people making a salad. And then they were invited to eat the salad afterwards. Another thing that Allison did is one of her uh, artist friends said, you know, you eat the same thing every day for lunch. Are you aware of that? And she became aware that, yes, she did eat the same thing every day for lunch. And so she created something called Identical Lunch. And it was a tuna fish sandwich, a wheat toast, with lettuce and butter, no mayo. And what she would do is she would send that to someone, like she, she sent it to Ken, and said, I'm having this at noon tomorrow. Do you want to join me? Or do you just want to, at noon, by yourself, have this sandwich and think about it? Uh, she did this for a year, and she kept a journal of identical lunch, and she photographed some of the folks, but it really was about how do we come together as community, in community. And it, it's really not about maybe eating together, it's about just because we may not be together, but just at that moment in your day, it's like a meditation, right? You just stop. And you kind of think about it. And so Allison, it, the Berkeley Art Museum, just did a uh, an anniversary, a retrospective of her work uh, this past year. And she's, she's really quite something. Um, Sean, Sean has some stories about her afterwards, which are pretty beautiful. So, in the, you know, in the beginning, Fluxus was very porous because there wasn't really a group. Um, Georgie Leggetti did a piece with 100 metronomes at a Fluxus festival where people just turned them on and uh, it stopped when they all just ran out of steam. Joseph Boyce sat at a table uh, and he wound up a musical toy and just sat there and watched the toy. Stood up and bowed and that was it. The next day at the festival, he wrapped himself in felt and he laid there for nine hours next to a dead hair. So uh, I, I mentioned Yoko Ono, who really was very seminal in this. She, many of you may know that she did a piece called Cut Piece, uh, where she sat on stage and she invited the audience to come with scissors and cut her clothes. She didn't have anyone to intervene. Uh, she just allowed the audience to control that. Um, she did it a couple of times, and it got a, a kind of out of hand uh, because people were like, how far will this go? And it's like, well, how far is the audience willing to let this go? Um, Namjoon Pike, I, I, I talked about him a little bit. Uh, he, of course, went off and began to do his other work as well. Um, he worked a lot with Charlotte Mormon. They, they were arrested one time at a happening because Charlotte was topless playing the cello. And so their response was, um, then Jim Pike made little TV sets to go over her breasts so she could play the cello and not be arrested. So, you know, they, they worked a lot on these things. Uh, French artist Ben Bautier um, really took the Duchamp thing Seriously, and he he um, would take bottles, and he would certify that they were art by signing his name on them. And then he would say, "Okay, this is now this is art certified by me." He also lived uh, in the in a storefront in the gallery for a week, and the the public could come in. Now, this is well before a lot of artists are doing these living in galleries kinds of thing. But Ben was doing it, and then Shigeko Kubata. Um, is someone who's now finally getting her due. Um, she's a, a very uh, seminal piece called Vagina Painting. 
where she actually had the, the, the paint stick in her vagina, she squatted and she painted. Um, and the Japan Foundation next month is having um, uh, a film, uh, I mean, an exhibition of Jap four women Japanese artists, including her and Yoko Ono, in Fluxus. So they're really looking back at this work as something being really influential. Dick Higgins, who we saw, was there. Um, it had a, um, a studio in West Clover, Vermont. And he and Allison Knowles had been married early on, and then they were they were close friends. But he took, and he was in John Cage's class. I, I love what he says. He says, Flux is, is not a moment in history. It's a way of doing things. It's a tradition. Uh, a Japanese artist, Miko Shimoni, described Flux as for her as pragna pragmatic consciousness. See things differently in everyday life after performing or seeing Flux's works. Yeah. I didn't realize if Sam was ready. <laughs> I'll have the butter too. Thank you. So Machunas, this was an impresario. He failed at everything, but he tried to, to brand Fluxus, right? He, it, it was his name, and so he really wanted to do something with it. And he was a graphic designer. So Fluxus started having all these great logos. Okay? And then they would do these unlimited editions of things. They would, they would put out some of these performance scores, and they, it was a box set, but it was whoever wanted one could buy one. No one bought them, really, but they had these box sets. Um, they had chess sets, um, they put out newspapers, uh, there was an apron uh, that they tried to sell for clothing. In fact, on Canal Street, right by where you lived as a kid, there was a flux shop. It was there for one year, um, 1964. I'm a tunist, has never sold anything. Um, but, so that's some of the more performative things. I mentioned Yoko Ono's light match thing. There were about 40 films that were also made um, in, uh, by Fluxus artists. And John, I just watched last night, I, I'm reading the Lou, K Lou Reed biographies, and John Cale, who was one of his certain collaborators, was a Fluxus artist, because he studied with Lamaya, the guy who did Draw the Line, right? Um, and John Cale made one of the Fluxus films. And so it's really interesting, but, but all of these films were just everyday actions. They weren't embellished. And one of Yoko's famous films is called Number Four, and it's just butts of her friends in the art world. And she just asked them to walk two or three steps, and they, um, you, all you see is the frame of the butt. And it's men and women, you have no idea who they are, they're anonymous. Um, one of our Fluxus artists here in Vermont is named Don Faribus, but back then she was married to Jeff Hendricks. And she said, Jeff and her husband, their, their butts are in the film. And, and she, she told me that when they first were at a screening and her butt was on the screen, the guy behind her said, Jesus Christ. <laughs> but, but I said she, she didn't know if he liked it or hated it. <laughs> so, um, anyway, that, so these folks were also doing many other things at the same time as other people were as well. Male art was happening then. And, and Nai and Yoko, they raised their kids together, so they, they sent postcards to each other. And also, the small presses, Dick Higgins in West Glover had uh, his own small press. Um, and if you think about when then John Lennon came into Yoko Owner's life, and you look at some of her things about imagine peace, imagine the sky, look at the sky. Um, eventually, Yoko was actually credited as one of the co-writers of Imagine. And John apologized that it took decades for that to happen. Um, but it, it was her influence of Fluxus that had him, they wrote that song together, imagine. Um, I mentioned Jeff and uh, B.C. Hendricks, that, who's now, B.C. is now my favorite, 
after 10 years of being married, they, um, he said, how should we celebrate? And she said, well, let's get a divorce. So they had a flux divorce, okay, at their house. And they had Louise Nelson, their neighbor, and John and Yoko came, and Kate Millett was there. Kate, um, let's see, Jill Johnson played the piano. And she, they put barbed wire down the hallway, and they asked the men to come to, on one side, and the women to come on the other side. And then they sawed their bed in half, and then they took their marriage certificate and cut it up in bits. And the, the, they have two kids, and they, the kids sewed their mom and dad jackets back to back, and they had the men pull on Jeff's side and the women pull on BC's sides until they were pulled apart, and that was the event for their divorce. Okay. Years later, the uh, Museum of Modern Art uh, has flux divorce um, box of things, and it was contributed to Jeff Andrews. Hmm. Interesting that the man gets the credit. <laughs> Surprise, right? In our world. Anyway, they they um they 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 changed that, but people had to remind them about that. Uh, George Machunas at the end of the he looked confused. They only credited him. No, I understand that. I just wondered why the museum owned something. Well, what happened is these it's a very great question. In hindsight, these artists became so influential and seminal that the, the museums wanted to start collecting some of this stuff. Even though it was very ephemeral stuff, um, they wanted to collect them. So, um, George Machunas, at the end of his life, wanted to get married. Um, and so they had a flux wedding. And George and his wife, Billy, they cross-dressed. and. Everybody had a good time at, at the thing. Um, there were flex meals that you were invited, but th they were often color-coded. So if Jen invited us to her house for a flex meal and she said it was a, a brown evening, it meant only that the food could be brown, the clothing could be brown, you know, or however you did brown, or you know, you could invite us to a white meal. Okay, and the same. So it was just everybody created these things in the way they wanted to. Charlotte Mormon, the cellist who I mentioned, she did um, avant-garde festivals every year, and um, when her knife fair was got in trouble in New York, she she kids, so she took diapers, and they were clean diapers, but she was washing them in the Central Park um, fountains, and the park, the park District people thought they were dirty diapers, and it was just, you know, um, but she has those now, you can, you, those are framed. Um, so, um, so Jeff and John Hendricks, two, two singles, who grew up in Putney, their dad, Walter Hendricks, founded Marlboro College. Um, Dick Higgins, like I mentioned, was in West Glover, Allison Knowles went to Middlebury College, and Nye now lives in Brattleboro. So uh, Warhol hung out, of course, with the, the Fluxus folks. He, he was a little younger than them, but was part of the scene. But if you look at really his early films, especially the screen tests, they're very much like what the Fluxus artists were doing. Of no effect, just straight at the camera. Right? And then, of course, he did his whole pop thing. Um, Flux shop that failed in 64. Keith Haring had a shop um, in 86, his pop shop. It's very similar to what the, the Fluxus folks were trying to do. And, um, you know, if I think about someone I admire a great deal, uh, Marina Aber, Abba, how do you say her last name, Jen? Thank you. Um, when she sits there and does her pieces sitting in galleries and stuff, I really think about Ben Boitier doing it 30 years earlier. You know, it, it, no one really originated any of this stuff, but it was like a moment of, in, that catalyzed. So, um, we're going to show you, um, well, I, I, after, I'm going to tell you a little about, about it, and then Sean's going to talk to you about it as well. I'm going to show you a 14-minute uh, video I recently made called Flux, and it's my homage to these folks. Now, what I tried to do is not do what any of them did, 
but I took their performance scores and tried to figure out how I could make my own way through this, my own version of this. Um, and um, it, it, was, it was like a COVID project. I had to like figure out a way to start a new one. So this was a way for me. But I love Sean Clute as an artist. I love him as a person. And I was thinking he would be the perfect person to work with on this to create a sound score. Because he would really get it. And uh, so, but, but, so I was, I have a little pony in Williston, some of you know that, at a barn. And so I was, I was thinking I wanted to call Sean. And all of a sudden, his two daughters, who are here tonight, okay. uh, came to the barn to be in pony camp. And Dad was dr driving, and I couldn't believe it. It was Sean. So, uh, I'll, you can take it there. I'm going to eat more of the sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it was pretty uh, serendipitous to meet John at the pony camp. I drop my kids off, and I hear, Sean, Sean Clute. And I look over, and there's John Clacky feeding Pacific Raindrop, which is his pony, quite a beautiful pony. And then um, John asked me, um, so do you know anything about Fluxus? And um, I had to chuckle because um, I did know about Fluxus, but when I first learned about Fluxus, I didn't really know it was Fluxus, uh, which maybe says something about the art form. I was um, in Albuquerque, New Mexico as an undergraduate many, many uh, years ago, and I needed to get extra credit for this, um, this class I was taking, and the professor said, well, if you volunteer uh, for this theatrical production, then, then I'll give you the extra credit. So I thought, okay, great, I'll do that. And I did, and it was incredible, it was by this director named Steve Peters, who ran a record label called Non Sequitur Records in Albuquerque. And it happened to be a record label that was dedicated to Flux's sound artist. So part of me volunteering meant I got to pick some CDs from this, this catalog, and I didn't know any of the names or, or any of these artists. So I picked one, and it was by uh, Allison Knowles, who John briefly mentioned. And it was a CD called Friole's Canyon. I'd never heard anything like this before. It was these field recordings that Allison had made in New Mexico, Colorado. Uh, and it was also recordings of people making beans uh, in like traditional ways with like, you know, buckets and, and water. And I, I don't know, I, it was like this whole sound kind of world. And I thought to myself, wow, you can do that, and that can be a CD. That's like, okay. <laughs> and that kind of blew my mind. So uh, that was my first introduction to Fluxus, and it came to mind when talking to, to John uh, and learning about this piece was um, thinking that I would start with simple objects or field like recordings. Oh, yeah, I'm forgetting something. Well, he also told me that uh, he was in, he was in tracks, uh, he ran track at college. And what he would do is he would put this Allison Knowles tape on to get in the zone, okay? And so he really related to this music. It was really powerful for him. So it was like, okay, we got a partnership going on Fluxus, just that it's Allison Knowles could put him in the zone. I just knew that this was going to be perfect. No, it is, it is true, and but because before that it was the Nine Inch Nails, the heavy industrial opening in the zone. But then it, it was an odd time, I suppose. But it worked. I did okay. Um, so, uh, but Allison in, in her field recordings, I thought for John's piece, I would also do recordings in the, in my uh, yard. My kids like leaving things like kids do, just laying in the yard, pipes and, and wood. I know, that's you, Juniper, I know. Uh, and um, so I recorded some, um, I think it was pipes and, and some other debris. Uh, but it didn't quite work with the film. And um, it was, it, it just, it didn't work it, it, because um, there was already a lot of objects being used and it didn't make sense visually and all these things. So as a result, I did end up taking them, 
but instead I process them with the computer. And I manipulate them, I stretch the, the time out of them, and uh, EQ or filter the, the frequencies of these various objects. And um, the result of which you can kind of hear is, is like a, a sound bed or supports the, the performance that John um, performs in, in the Flux video. Okay, should we see it? Yeah. Okay, let's see. It. Uh, where's Wendy? Oh, Wendy. So, as I was saying, this video is also going to be on Vermont uh, Public on October 26th, which is really cool. And next month, I'm in Artists in Residence at Champlain College, and we're going to have what's called Flux Fest. And so, we've invited a number of artists to make Flux inspired work. Not, not Flux's work, but Flux inspired work. So, here's, here's Flux. Mm -hmm.
thank you. Uh, Sean and I would be glad to answer questions. Accusations. <laughs> <laughs> if, if people have any. Uh, yes, Ken. Um, the, one of the things that I like about the draw line and follow piece, and I'm sorry I missed your execution of it, um, is that it collapses your action and your reaction into a single moment. Fundamentally, you have to think about what you're doing from the perspective of your approach and the expected result in a very different way. I don't get that so much from the sandwich because you're, you've sort of got the, the same objective in mind. You're maybe doing it more mindfully, but the process that you're following is pretty much the same that you would do if you're ordinarily making a sandwich. So I'm wondering if you could kind of draw the connection from there between those two approaches. Well, that's a, that's a, first of, that's a great distinction. Um, I'm not sure I see them differently. And I, I, I don't know if, uh, as I understand the Allison Knowles thing, is for us to do our own action however we want to with that eat a sandwich. And it didn't have to be her tuna fish sandwich necessarily. And it didn't have to be in her loft, didn't have to be at the same time. It could, and I, so I think it was, she was inviting us to just mindfully eat a sandwich in whatever way we would do that. Mm -hmm. uh, which to me, that's what Lamont invited us to do with the draw line. I, I, I love that piece too. I, uh, and what I did in my piece, because I had to, um, I had to create sort of a visual art for myself about how I was going to do this, and it was done in one take. So I, I practiced in my garage for weeks, <laughs> but I drew the line so I would understand where I had to go next in case I forgot. And, and of course, uh, the audience will know none of this when they see it on Vermont Public in, in the next month. And I hope they just see this kind of meditative piece about intention or something, or just like a, a quiet piece for them to kind of zen out on. Um, I don't know, Sean, do you have any? I, I mean, that's a great question. I don't know if I have an answer to that question, but I would say that one thing that I've really admired about Flux is, is the, are the scores that they make, because the way that their scores are written um, lend themselves to approach it from many different media or many different genres, making it what, which is what they would uh, refer to as intermedia or a combination of media. And um, they're a very pivotal group in the sense for me that they kind of broke that barrier between uh, the, this is the painter does this and the photographer does this. but. Through the scores, you can interpret it so, so many different ways that really it could be many different, many different things or many different variations on that score. Now, I have written you an email. I hope you are going to contribute to FluxFest. <laughs> you are invited yet again personally. Uh, Jen Berger back there is going to be having a piece in, in the FluxFest show we're doing, it, as is Sean. Um, yes, back there. <laughs> what, what did we learn from making it? Can I ask your dad to answer that first? Sure. Uh, then I'll answer. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Juniper, you, you always ask the most challenging questions to answer. <laughs> but thank you for your question. Uh, what did I learn? Oh, my gosh. Um, I mean, so many things, but one thing in particular is that this is the first time I had ever collaborated with John before. And whenever collaborating or, or working with uh, someone brings up a whole bunch of new questions and new processes of making and new kind of understanding of the, the exchange of feedback. And um, I should say through this process, uh, I. This, this version was certainly not the very the first version, in fact. This was many iterations, many drafts of this work um, uh, before reaching this final result. So I, I would answer that I learned a lot about collaboration and in particular collaborating with John. 
I hope I hope I learned how to pay attention to what I'm doing, even if I'm just sitting waiting. Like like tonight, I was here early and I just sat here. You know? I loved how when you came and sat, I felt like you really were present and just sitting. And and I'm not so good at that. I'm usually scrolling on my phone or I'm looking at something or thinking about something and. and um, we, I only did this in one take, which meant I only did it once. I had three cameras there, um, but I had to really practice to be focused on it. But even though there were three camera people, light people, and sound people all in the room, I had to really pay attention as if none of them were there. You know, so I think, I hope I learned to pay attention better and to be quieter, not so busy. I learned that from my pony though too. <laughs> when we're out in the field and she's grazing, I can just be there with her. Yeah. Here and then back there. Yeah. Um, so, with this kind of piece, I keep thinking about this intersection of like three parts there's like the event score, like the instructions, there's the performance, and then there's the documentation. Um, what was in your experience, and it will probably vary depending on the artist, but in your experience, like, do you need all three of those to feel like the piece is complete? Like, or is the work diminished without one of those pieces? And I know, like, I'm more familiar with John Cage's work than the Flux as a whole, but there's, like, the question of, is the art the, the score? Like, is that the art, or is it the performance? And the score itself is irrelevant. So I'm just curious what you what your takeaway is. Well, do look in some of the catalogs over there because I think collecting institutions have had a very hard time figuring out what it is and then when they show it, like what it is that we're showing. Are we showing process? Are we showing objects? Are we showing thoughts? Are we showing scores? I mean, all of those things. Um, I mentioned Nye Ferris, 91 years old. She was very involved in, in the very seminal influxes. Uh, with her husband, Jeff Hendricks. Uh, she, um, her stuff is not so valuable. She's, we're not having her stuff at, at, at Champlain Art Gallery, but she's good to come and do a talk uh, as is someone who collects her work, uh, Mark Waskow. He he collects Flux's work. So we, we're going to have him talk about why he's collecting this work and what he looks at to collect. Um, but what I wanted to do, um, we found out that we were both Buddhists, and when you're a Buddhist, you take refuge, and you're given another name. And so I went down for Nai's 91st birthday, and she gave me a present, which was a license plate with which her Dharma name. And I asked her if I could um, exhibit that in the, in the Flux Fest, and she said, of course. Now, I was just gonna say Dharma plate, Nai Faribus, 2023. So it will have no meaning to anyone except you now. If you see that piece, like what, what, how is that? Is that fluxus? But it's just a license plate. But if the intention of my affair was made it something different. Um, and so for me, it's, it's art, but for many people, it will be a license plate. Jen? You might have already answered this, but I want to hear how you have to make my conscious. But I noticed in the film how attentive you were to everything that you were doing, and that at the end of each thing, you very carefully closed it up and put it back in a place before you started the next thing. You didn't leave anything in a different place. And I'm curious about, I, you might have answered, but I'm curious, like, what was behind that? What was the last part, Jen? What was what was your thought or like your intention? Like, why? What, what was your process in the meticulousness of your movements? Reasonably, okay. Um, I, I, I'm gonna just make sure I understood your question. So, okay, I can do it again without the mask. Okay, sure. Yeah. Just try the last. Did the last part without the mask? Um, I was just struck by how you put everything back in its place um, after you were finished with it before you moved on to the next thing 
and I was curious about your process around the meticulousness of your movements with each of the scores. Well, um, those of you who know me know I'm paraplegic, and I'm not very steady. And so I, I had to just be seated. I couldn't really move because if I stood up, I might kind of curry and knock something over. Um, and I also couldn't, like when Sean did his draw line, I couldn't do movement pace. You know, I tried, as I was developing this in my garage, I tried doing some other stuff and it just you know, looked a, a really silly for me to try to do that. So I, I, the premise was I was completely restricted to that tabletop and everything was a found object it was either in my house or I found it. And, and in fact, I married two people at a farm and they had this old table that the bride and groom sat at and then they were gonna throw the table out because it was so derelict. And I said, perfect, the table is perfect. So I'm bringing the table with me to Champlain College uh, Art Gallery. Now, will anyone know that that table is a table that's in the film that's next to it? I, I don't know, and I'm bringing the sculpture with me. Uh, and so I, I had to be really constrained physically, just for my body. and. So then I, I, I created sort of my choreography of it, like how can I get from, and I made all these lists of these scores that I really loved and that resonated with me and then I had to figure out a way to make them my own but, but make them in a, a narrative arc in a way. Um, so. Now, Sean did originally four different versions of a score which was really fascinating that he responded to material and want to talk about a little bit of that. How much time? Are we good for time? Finish up. What, fin finish up? Yeah. Okay. okay. You can ask him about that afterwards. Okay. <laughs> for sure. Um, I wanted to ask you, because you end your piece good, you know, and part work with the Bible, the books, but you haven't given us any fluxes in the words. I Why? Well, uh, Marcel Reuters was a Belgian artist who was a concrete poet and, uh, in the 50s. And he was invited in the 60s to work in a gallery. And he was like, oh my God, I'm a word person. What am I going to do? Uh, and so then he realized, well, it's just like Matunas did. He, he, he was a graphic designer as well, and he had the text on the walls. But he also took his existing books and put them in plaster of Paris and made that a sculpture. So what that is, is um, there's, I made three AIDS videos uh, in the 90s, and then I made some disability videos. Those are boxes of those videos, some of my earlier work, plus my book called Because of Art which happens to be over there for sale. <laughs> um, but I thought, well, that's actually my work. That's, that's what I have done in the world. And so I, I offered that as the culminating piece. So, well, first of all, thank you to the Advantage Council for letting us do this tonight. Uh, we're blessed and honored, and thank you for this wonderful library to host us and not freak out about food and water and things. Um, and matches. And matches, yes. Okay, anyway. I was watching. Thank you all very much. We're honored to be here.